we cannot know who God really is other than through unconditional love, and we cannot know our true identity other than through unconditional love, because it's actually revealed in that loving relationship with God himself. And the verse I'm going to highlight here is Jeremiah 17, 9. And when you compare the NIV with the Septuagint, you see how God's view of mankind has also been twisted by wrongly translating this verse. So you have this verse in the NIV, the heart is deceitful above all things. That's a powerful statement and beyond cure. Well, that's a pretty hopeless statement. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Now, that statement has made a major effect on how people view themselves and other people. And it really puts them in a position that the soul is never, ever really healed or made whole or restored. Because, well, how can it be? Because it's so weak, deceitful. It's beyond cure. It's beyond healing. It's beyond restoration. Now, I don't believe that's true. So what does the Septuagint say from Jeremiah 17.9? In the Septuagint, it's Jeremiah 17.5, because they all slightly have different verse structures. The heart of man is deep beyond all things, and it is the, it is the man. Even so, who can know him? So in reality, what this is saying is that our heart is not wicked, and deceitful and beyond cure but our heart is deep beyond anything we could come up with ourselves and it really is who we really are and therefore we can't know who we really are in our own flesh in our own understanding it has to come through our relationship with god so this different translation form how we perceive ourselves and others so the NIV gives a very low view of humanity. I was programmed by that view, man being wicked, corrupted, totally depraved. That gave a theological perspective of worm theology. Well, you're no one and nothing. You know, you better hope that God has mercy on you because you're no one and nothing. And even after we receive salvation or come into a realization of salvation, many Christians still do not believe who they really are they still believe that they need to be humble and only think the worst of themselves and it gives so many people this lesser view of being sons and being christians than what god obviously intended us to have and that if our heart is deceitful desperately wicked and beyond cure well then what hope is there for us there's a sense where I'm always going to be a sinner saved by grace. It's a little bit like you know, the story of Winnie the Pooh and Eeyore, who always has this downbeat, oh, I'm no good and everything is going to be bad. And it creates that dynamic. So this degrades the soul's value and worth, so you can never really trust it. And of course, when we first come into that relationship where our spirit and soul are reconnected, they're connected back to the Holy Spirit, you have this wrestling between the soul and the spirit because the soul has been used to dictating how we live according to how we believe and what we thought and been brought up with. And then the spirit starts to bring us into this revelation of who we really are, revealing our true eternal nature, drawing us back into the fact that God has placed eternity in our hearts. And wants to draw us back into this amazing relationship where we come home, come back into him. That is completely undermined by a degrading of the value of the soul. And so many in the early church and others, you know, who had this understanding, and particularly when it came to the Catholic church, it was like, you know, persecuting the soul and the body, whipping themselves, you know, kneeling on broken glass. And oh, I was... Some of those things are horrendous, but why did they think that way? Because they just thought of themselves as lesser than God really intended them to have. So that view creates a suspicion of the soul, lessens the value of mankind. Man is seen as inherently bad. So by degrading humanity, there's a gospel message to sell there. We're so bad, we need saving. Using the motivation of the fear of punishment to sell that message. Well, the reality is God doesn't view us as bad. 
God views us through the lens of Jesus and through the lens of who he made us to be, his sons. We've always been his sons. We've never not been his sons. But that's not the way I was taught to believe. You know, I was always taught to believe, well, you're not good enough. You know, and, and you really can never be good enough. And I know we can't in our own strength. But when we become who we really are, then we begin to outwork a whole different dynamic to sonship. So the Septuagint actually says the heart of man is deep beyond all things, and it is the man. So the human heart is deep, multifaceted, amazing, created in God's image and likeness, as we are. Psalm 139 says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God has a vast sum of amazing thoughts about us. We need to get to know those thoughts. And our mind needs to be deconstructed from the negative things we might have believed so we can really know the truth of agreeing with God about us. Psalm 8 says, we are made only a little lower than God himself. What is man that you think of him? Verse 4, a son of man that you are conceived of, concerned about him. Now that is man's thoughts. It's almost like, well, who are we that you would even consider us? And that is the man's view. That's the tree of the God, knowledge of good and evil man, way of looking at it. Man, how, who is us? We're nothing. How do you think of us about us in any way? But then it says, yet. So yet, even though we think this about ourselves, yet you have made him a little lower than God and you crown him with glory and majesty. You have him rule over the works of your hands and you put everything under his feet. Now, you could say that was talking about Jesus, but actually the New Testament confirms it's talking about all man. And the fact in the beginning, we were clothed with glory and majesty. And we are being restored into that glorious understanding of who we really are as sons. So the heart of every child of God is so precious. And however damaged it is, it's still valuable beyond measure. And God wants to restore and heal and make us whole, spirit, soul, body. So we can truly be one and whole and come into that intimacy with him. Who can know such depths? So who can know the deep things of the human heart? We can retrieve and restore the value of our true selves. Who can do it? How can we do it? Well, God can do it. He can retrieve and restore the value of our true selves. Only in the mirror of God's face can we see our true identity revealed. You can never do it by looking at what you do. You can never do it looking through the lens, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we have to do it of looking face to face, heart to heart, mind to mind with the Father that he reveals our true nature as sons. And this is what the unconditional love of God is designed to do, to mirror God's love for us who he values beyond measure. We are the apple of his eye. We are the treasure of his heart. So 1 Corinthians 2.12 says, now we have not received the spirit of the world because you're never going to know who you are through the spirit of the world. But the Spirit is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Who we really are. Our destiny, which is a reflection of who we really are, an outworking of who we really are. God wants us to know the truth of his unconditional love for us and our value and worth to him. And if you don't feel that, if you feel less than, if you still struggle with the value of your soul, if you still struggle as thinking you're still a sinner, and therefore struggling with that lost identity, struggling with your behavior and everything else, it is something that God wants to bring about that renewing of your mind to change and transform the reality of who you are so you can truly know him and know yourself. We need to know him intimately to know the truth and the depth of who we really are. I mean, I had no idea of who I was as a son of God. I had no idea of my position seated in the heavenly places. I had no idea of my function and roles in the realms of heaven and in the dimensions and in all the other multidimensional realities that we can engage. I had no idea. I was stuck on the earth. I was stuck in a less than kind of life. It's like I was designed to fly like an eagle and I was living like a chicken. Now, there's nothing wrong in chickens. I like chicken. So there's nothing wrong in a chicken per se. But if you think you're a chicken and in fact you're an eagle, 
then you're never going to fly. And there's something with birds that they imprint on the first thing they see. Um, and so if an eagle imprints with a chicken, it never flies. Even though it's capable of, it never gets off the ground because it thinks it's a chicken. And literally, we have been deceived into thinking we're confined, earthbound, stuck in this dimension. We'll only get to heaven when we die, maybe, for some. Now, that whole deception needs to change. We need to know who we really are. We need to know where we're seated in heavenly places. We need to know the authority we have in the angelic realm. We need to know the authority we have in the earth shield, how we can operate the gateways of the heavens, how we can bring about restoration to all things. That is our role. That is our identity. Creation is waiting, longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And yet we have been deceived into believing us worthless and valueless or to strive to prove how good we are or how valuable we are by what we do and being worn out and weary by doing it we need to know him we cannot do it independently of a relationship so when you look at another person what do you do how do you see them do you see them from their surface appearance do you see them from what they're doing and how they're living? Do you make value judgments on who they are by what they do and how they appear? Or do you look deeper? Are you willing to look into the eyes of a person to see the depth of their heart, which is their true self? Are you willing to look beyond their surface? When I was being transformed and when I had experiences of the unconditional love of God and when God was challenging my understanding of justice and fairness and everything else, I had this experience that I shared before, being under a waterfall and having this cascading revelation come down over me that revealed how much God loved the, the unlovable and how much God loved those who were victims in their lives, people who've been abused, people who've been hurt, people who've been abandoned, rejected and treated badly, you know, and how much God loved equally the abusers. And it so challenged my way of look people. And the next day, having had that experience, I was in my office and I was just thinking about the experience. And all of a sudden I was taken in the spirit to stand by the front door of our building. Now, as a ministry, we are involved with helping people who are in poverty, homeless, people who are addicted and anyone who's in need, basically. And some of the people who come into our building look on the surface pretty disheveled. Some of them look half dead because they're, you know, very addicted to different sorts of drugs. Some of them, you know, don't care about themselves. So they, they don't wash, they don't think they're living on the streets and you look at them and you make a judgment on what you see. And I was looking at them and God enabled me to see into their heart, to see who he had made them to be, to see the light that was in them that amazing light that amazing soul that amazing person that amazing destiny that person who was fearfully and wonderfully made and i was standing there in the spirit looking and i was actually looking it wasn't a, a vision i was looking at people coming into the building and it totally changed how i viewed those people i no longer made any judgment on what they looked like or how they smelled or what they might be doing, I wanted them to know the unconditional love of God. I wanted them to know the reality of who they really are, who they really are, the truth, the reality of their identity as sons of God. Even though they don't know it yet, God wants them to have that light revealed. And it's our responsibility as being the light of the world. It's our responsibility as being ambassadors of reconciliation, carrying this good news this true good news. So it's time we forget worm theology. It's time we forget judging people's deepest hearts as deceitful and desperately wicked. People are just operating at a lost identity. They don't know who they are. They're desperate to find love. They're desperate to know why they're here, what they're doing. They may have been messed up by life, but God is wanting to restore them and receive them and make them feel the truth of who they are, to know that truth, to know that they're loved unconditionally. 
let's present a good news message to them. Let's tell people that God loves them. Let's tell people that they're already reconciled, they're already forgiven, they're already loved. Let's not make them jump through hoops of trying to make themselves better. Let's value them as you would a priceless jewel or gemstone, because that's how God does. Let's see them the way God sees them. Let's see them through the lens of the Father's eyes so we can truly see those people and value them as we value ourselves. Jesus said to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. How can we do that? By being loved. That's the only way we can do it, by being loved unconditionally so that we can love others unconditionally. Thank you for watching our YouTube channel. We really appreciate you taking the time. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.